This podcast is sponsored by Tusk, an open source non-ICO crypto project powered by community. Check them out on the web at tusk.network. That's T-U-S-C dot network. The Rob McNeely Program is the nexus of cryptocurrency, blockchain technology, and entrepreneurship. Now, welcome to the program. Today, I'm talking to Vinny Riley. He is one of the co-founders of Goshstein Magazine out of New York. Vinny, how are you today, sir? I'm doing well, man. I'm doing well. It's, uh, you know, it's kind of a rainy day here in New York, but, you know, it's, it's a beautiful day, man, in crypto always. Yeah, I think people that bought two years ago might disagree with that. I, honestly, I was one of the people that bought two years ago. And You're I'm the guy. Thinking, You're I, the guy. I'm <laughs> one of the guys. Honestly, I'm one of the guys that bought two years ago, and I am still here, you know, tail between the legs a little bit, you know, for not selling at the peak. But, you know, that's, that's part of – it's part of my experience, man. And, you know, I think it's – it's made me a better overall trader, but overall gained so much experience over the last two years as far as when the next bull market comes, because inevitably it will come. And when it does, I'll be better prepared for it, at least for, for me. You know, I'm excited. You know, I bought then. I continue to buy. And, you know, I just DCA on a weekly basis. And, you know, I'm just ready for, for takeoff, man. Well, I, I think that's a really good attitude to have because I know a lot of people just cried and in their milk and left and got depressed and started doing a lot of drugs. So, hey, you got a really good attitude about it, and that's good. And, you know, I'll be honest, I don't consider myself a trader. And the, the only reason I did not, like, cut my wrist, you know, and get all depressed is because I actually got some dumb luck trades at close to the peak, and that made it all the difference for us. So, you know. I, I'm not going to be too miserable, but I don't consider myself a trader. I don't know the first thing about trading. I got you. Yeah, I'm, I'm not big into it either. Honestly, I have a, a few close friends and stuff. I really listen to as far as their advice, but at the end of the day, it comes down to like my decision. So I like to compare a few people, and if both of them have a similar analysis, you know, I tend to run with it. Um, what I noticed too as well, what I like to look at too, like for me is I like to look at, the percentage versus longs versus shorts. Um, and like me and my friend were talking about it earlier today. And I think it was like 5% people shorting or something. And like the rest were all longs. And we're like, yo, it's going to dump. It's going to dump. And, you know, hopefully we could be wrong. We could be wrong. But it's just, you know, history, at least from what I've noticed over the last, you know, two, three years is it, it you know, big money always makes money. Well, it's certainly easier to make money if you already have money. Yeah, you know, I, it, do you have any, Rob? I need some. Do I, do I have money? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I, I, I'm just a, I'm just a middle class guy, man. So, uh, you know, I'm just kind of out there hustling, trying to do my day to day. You know, if I was some big money guy in crypto, I wouldn't have a still have a day job, right? So, uh, but. But the thing is, like with our project anyways, everybody's got a day job. There is no employees of Tusk and there's no full-time developers. And, you know, we all are truly, you know, the personification of what a community project is because we all have day jobs and we all haven't scrubbed our LinkedIn's, right? <laughs> so, um, so tell me a little bit about Gosh Time Magazine. Weeks. It'll be out before Christmas time. Um, and then it's just really exciting, man, as far as all, you know, the conferences we got to travel to and, you know, all the great people we got to meet. I got to meet Charles Hoskinson. I got to meet Charlie Lee. I got to meet, you know, Derek Kappel from, you know, Token Pay. But aside from that, all the great people that come onto our magazine that we got to feature, you know, like Justin Sun, we interviewed Craig Wright, you know, previously we just had, you know, um, Justin Sunrock, the lead developer for Verge. So it's, it's, it's really interesting. It's something that we enjoy doing, but also at the same time, it's like we get to meet passionate people that are doing something for the space at the same time. So it's kind of like a win-win. 
So why a print magazine? You know, everybody in crypto seems to be all about the digital and moving from paper to digital. Yet you guys are doing kind of a, you know, a paper thing. Do you think that's the, is that a strategic direction? Do you think that's the best direction to go? For right now, honestly, the majority of our stuff is all digital. We do offer a print solution, and the print solution really is only for when we attend, like, major conferences. So, like, the previous one we were at, like, WCC and, you know, Futurist and stuff like that, that's where we'll bring some physical copies. Um, but for the majority, you know, we are looking at as far as partnering with another uh, blockchain, you know, magazine that has a print solution. But it's so expensive, and the logistics behind it is just – it's not – it's not even sure if it'll make financially sense, you know, I like how like Kindle came around and like, you know, Barnes and Noble, like everything went, you know, just everything geared towards internet and e-reading and everything like that. So, and as far as from like a number standpoint, you know, the amount of digital downloads that we get as opposed to the amount of like physical hard copies we sell, it just outweighs it. But at the end of the day, still people like at a conference or something, still like a still like, you know, kind of like souvenir or something to take home. Um, so that's why we try to bring, you know, a little of both, um, offer both experiences. What would you say your, your kind of your angle that you approach crypto with, with your publication? The main difference between us, and I would say the majority of any other publication is, is everybody else is just geared on just crypto, 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 you know, which is great. That's why we're here. You know, that's, that's our main love. That's our baby. Yeah. Obviously crypto blockchain adoption. I'm all for it, but I didn't want to just corner ourselves into that niche market, you know, like granted, yes, crypto is, you know, multi-billion dollar industry. Sure. No problem. But at the same time, people don't want to just read about crypto. You know, that's why we try to incorporate lifestyle. We try to incorporate travel. We try to incorporate art and fashion too, as well. Um, so that I don't see anybody else really doing that at all. Um, at least from my experience, at least I haven't noticed it. So beyond the actual magazine publication, uh, you mentioned that you want to develop a full media company. What all is on your roadmap and horizon with your project? Well, for right now, we offer as, you know, as encompassing a full media company, as opposed to just offering, you know, ad solutions as far as within our magazine. Um, we have, we're looking into doing events, hosting events, hosting parties, um, but also making these events and meetups something different, something unique, you know, um, from my experience of traveling to all of these, you know, crypto events and everything like that, and some of them are beautiful, some of them are lavish, and all that is great. But when you get there, you'll do a walk around, you know, you, you'll check out all the booths and everything, and then usually there's an awesome after party at the end. Um, but while I'm there, like, I go ahead and I do my walk around and everything. I check out everybody. I get 113 business cards that I put in my pocket. But I'm like, you know, what's next? I'm like, where's the bar? You know, because I want to have fun. I want to have fun when I'm there. So like my idea of what I would like to do as far as from like an event standpoint is like, listen, you want to come to my event? Yeah, we're going to have all of that. But you know what? I'm going to have a bouncy castle over there. You know, I'm going to have face painting over here so you could bring your kids. A whole bunch of different stuff. But we also want to incorporate education too as well. So, you know, a lot of people in the industry, at least, you know, what I've noticed is everybody wants to be the most intelligent. Nobody wants to look silly. Everybody wants to seem the most brightest and whatnot. But everybody is a little taken aback to say, hey, listen, I'm not sure what that means. I don't know what that means. We plan on doing a little bit of education as, as opposed if we're, you know, teaching blockchain to a five-year-old and kind of like dumbing it down but also having, you know, big speakers come in, like, say, possibly Justin's son of Tron or something, you know, speak about Tron. Like, what is Tron? Tron's great. We know Tron, 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 because Justin, you know, promotes it. He, he's a phenomenal marketer. But go in depth. Tell me about Tron. Tell me what the transactions per second mean. Like, what, what is this going to do? How is this going to change the game? 
And I think the more knowledge people have about it and the more it's broken down and simplified, I think that makes it easier to spread adoption because if your normal Joe person comes to their conference and, you know, sometimes it can be overwhelming, but if you're able to teach them something and they're able to leave with more knowledge than they got there with, and change their perspective a little bit, they're going to go home and tell somebody about it. And that's how that whole ripple wave, you know, starts. That's how adoption spreads. We need the people to do it. So I'm looking at an angle as where we can make that happen, but also make it fun for everybody. I think that's a really healthy attitude. So let me talk a little bit about, you know, crypto in general, as far as your, how your magazine views it. Uh, crypto seems to be very tribal. Yeah, you have Bitcoin maximalists out there and things of that nature. And, and a lot of publications are also kind of biased <laughs> one way or the other. Are you guys uh, more Bitcoin focused in, in, or do you really look at altcoins and uh, the greater blockchain community and all the different types of uh, projects that are out there? No, we try to offer, you know, we're definitely not maximalists. That's, that's for sure. You know, my opinion, yes, Bitcoin is king, will always be king. But I would be naive, in my opinion, to say that, like, that's it. That's the end all be all. Like, there's hundreds and hundreds of great community projects. Like, for yours, example, is a wonderful project. You know what I mean? And it's going to be a great blockchain. But why not give opportunity and sh shed light to these wonderful community-driven projects that deserve exposure? You know, why limit ourselves to just talk about... Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, why? It, 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 makes, no, it makes no sense. At, at the same time, all of these other, these other projects too as well, they have the community behind it. You know, sure, Bitcoin, everybody loves Bitcoin, but everybody likes to, like, everybody likes to rock their favorite sporting team too as well. And like, that's what I noticed too as well is like how you said like crypto is a bit of tribalism. But it's become also too is like you're rooting for your favorite sports team as far as like your favorite crypto that you're backing. So we try to give and share the love to everybody. So, you know, I always wonder then why aren't people rocking their Visa and MasterCard t-shirts? See, that exactly. I got my Bitcoin t-shirt, right? My Bitcoin hoodie right here, man. No, I just meant from the standpoint that you don't see that. <laughs> so, no, no, you know, you don't, the, you don't see that at all. Never. So what are the kind of products are you associated with besides the magazine itself? Myself, personally, I'm also uh, a community manager for Telcoin. Um, what Telcoin is, is basically it's going to be the new Western Union. As to simplify it enough, what Telcoin is doing is disrupting the mobile money industry, but also the remittance industry at the same exact time. So what it's allowing people to do is allowing people from say point A to point B to send funds back home to, to their loved ones for a significant discounted rate. For example, I believe Western Union charges somewhere between five and 10%. Telcoin will be able to do that same exact transaction as opposed to having to have somebody go to a local Western Union, require a bank account, wait five to 10 days for that transaction. Telcoin aims to do it with about anywhere between one to 2% for the whole transaction. The beautiful thing about it too as well is it's instantaneously. I send Telcoin to, to my art director on the opposite side of the world. I live in New York, he lives in Sydney, Australia. It took about 15 seconds. And I didn't even need to do it through the Ethereum blockchain, which yes, Tel is a utility token built on, you know, it's an ERC20 token. But I didn't send it through the blockchain. I have the option where if I want to, I can send it through the blockchain, but I sent it right directly to his phone number. So the way they're, they're doing this, they're leveraging your mobile network operators. So for instance, the United States, the big companies are your Verizons, your AT&Ts and whatnot. But where they're targeting is, you know, the big populated areas where predominantly the most money is remitted to annually. So that's where they're honing in on their business model. And then they're jumping from, from that big area from A to B to C 
but they're leveraging the, the mobile network operator. And I say it twice, I don't mean to be repetitive, but it's so important because these people in these other countries like Africa, Singapore, Malaysia, all these places, a lot of these people don't have smartphones, even though some of them are very up and coming. But a lot of these people still don't know about cryptocurrency either. And the beautiful thing is, is that they don't even need to. They, don't e they won't even essentially need to know that they're using Telcoin because it's going to be a service that's offered by, say, your Verizon, your AT&T, somebody you already trust, somebody you've been paying a bill to for the last 10, 15 years. Now they're going to say, hey, we have this option where instead of you going over here and using company X, Y, and Z, we can just do it for you and we can save you, you know, 75% of your fees. And then you have the option to either use it for mobile money top ups, or you can have it, you know, they just integrated a partnership with, you know, Jamaya, which is basically the Amazon of Africa. So they're building this whole ecosystem. So it's a utility token made for remittances, but it just doesn't stop there. It sounds an awful lot like uh, Cointext on the BCH uh, blockchain. Hmm, I've never, I've never heard of them, to be honest. Are they leveraging uh, mobile network operators, though, too? Yeah, it's it's all every, it's all you designed to work on dumb phones. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. and so the phone number becomes the wallet. It's kind of an interesting technology, but it's Bitcoin Cash based, not Ethereum based. Gotcha. And do they have regulations as far? Could that's where I see like Tell being being at the forefront of this is they have their MSB, their money service business license from Canada. They have their VCE from in Singapore. So they have the blessing by all these financial sectors and these governments that which allow them to do it, but allow them to operate and do it legally without having to worry about being shut down in a week or so. Very cool. Yeah, I haven't uh, reached into, you know, how compliant they are or aren't, but I know they do serve, you know, all over Europe and the United States. So, uh, but I haven't dug into what their compliance is, not my project, yeah. but I just think it's interesting. And I think that eventually, you know, one of those types of products will be beneficial. I think with like all crypto, there's lots of great ideas, uh, but we seem to be lacking the ability, a lot of projects seem to be lacking like a go-to-market strategy uh, and marketing strategy in general. So it's just going to be interesting in my mind to see where these products kind of, and you know, where it all kind of shakes out. Uh, but I think, in, you know, I believe in the future that the, the most successful crypto projects will be the best marketed crypto projects. And right now, even if you go to the top 100 on coin market cap, very few of them are actually even being marketed. Yeah. And so I think that, I think the future is uncertain. You know, when people say Bitcoin will always be king, I don't necessarily agree with that because we haven't, they don't have adoption yet. No crypto products have adoption. All these crypto products have investors, okay. but as far as adoption, none of them do. Nobody's using cryptos for buying and selling goods and services at this point, pretty much anywhere uh, in any kind of real numbers. And so I think until that actually happens, I think the, the opportunities in the field are still wide open. I definitely understand. I, I, I get that point and it, and it, and it makes a hundred percent sense. I guess like when I say like Bitcoin is king, I mean, it's just, it's just the granddaddy for me as far as what brings every, what, what, uh, what brought everything else to the field, you know, sure. sure. At the same time, I think it's like the AOL. It's a little old, it's outdated, you know, but without that, we wouldn't have all these, you know, amazing projects, you know, being born today from it. Oh, no doubt. It's an amazing proof of concept. That's not yeah. what I'm getting at. And I am a holder of Bitcoin. So I'm not anti-Bitcoin by any stretch. I just think that as far as if you have to look five years out, and you had to say right now, what are going to be the top cryptos in five years? I don't think there's a safe bet to say any of them that sure. are on the top 100 right now. I think that the market could be vastly disrupted and different in five years than it is right now. Absolutely. See, that brings me to, to another point. 
like I think the most successful projects that will be going forward, as you as you say, I do agree with you, the ones that will be most marketed to as well. But I believe in the ones that actually have a real use case to as well. Um, and there are very few projects that are actually being used or piloted or in beta. Um, you know, kind of up until this point, it's kind of been a little bit of like smoke and mirrors a little bit like, and I'm kind of like, you know, waiting for it to clear and like, you know, what's behind the curtain. And there's, there's really not many that I, I, I can, I can really name that have that use case, you know, and like, I can't share, you know, my experience, you know, you know, what Telcoin has as far as, in the making but aside from that the only other project that i see that has an actual real working product is is te food that's the only other product that i see project that i see that has a real viable working product product it was a real company before it switched over to blockchain um people probably most people probably haven't even heard of it but I believe it's the top five blockchains as far as the amount of number of transactions. And if you look at their partnerships, and I, I'm not trying to shield this, but I'm trying more so saying that, hey, you other companies, you guys can talk a big game, but like at the end of the day, what, why, at least for me, why I'm going to buy your token or why I'm going to invest in it, into it is I need to see application. I need, I need, to have a reason why and not only how am I going to use it, but how is the mass and general public going to be used for it? I'm kind of a heretic when it comes to crypto in general, and I'm not shy about that. I have a lot of different opinions because I don't believe in groupthink and I'm not full of hopium. But I don't think of crypto projects in the same way as far as the wording people use around them, the vocabulary like use case. I can think of all sorts of use cases, meaning that something that crypto can fix or some kind of problem cryptos can solve. But I think looking forward in which I don't hear out pretty much anywhere in the space is who are the customers? Who are the people that are using these products and services and are willing to pay for them? And that's what I always kind of come back to. Who are the customers for the project? And how do you get your project in front of those customers? And to me, that goes back to just business. And to me, even though cryptos, some of them are decentralized and things of that nature, that doesn't mean they're not subject to the laws of the market. And to me, it doesn't matter how great your technology is. It doesn't matter how many features your technology even has. What matters is how does your product solve a problem for people and yep. how are you as someone on a team putting out a project, whether it's community based or an actual company or it's a DAO or what have you, what is your strategy to get your solution into the hands of the people who have a problem? And when I ask these questions, I get the funniest looks from lots of projects and, and, it's kind of a troll though, because a lot of, unfortunately, most crypto projects are led by development teams. They're not led by entrepreneurs or sales or marketing people. And so their worldview isn't really focused on those things. And, and I don't have an issue with that. I mean, it's just understanding how engineers think versus how business people think versus how sales and marketing people think. And unfortunately, for a successful project, I believe you need to have all of those attributes kind of combined into the project. And right now, most of the, the major projects out there are just led by developers. They don't have well-balanced teams. And most of them don't actually have market segmentation. They don't have marketing strategy and they don't really have salespeople. So to me, understanding how business works and having launched products and companies into the market uh, those are some of the most important things you need to think about. And when major products don't even think about those things, uh, that's why I'm very bearish on a lot of major projects that other people are very bullish on. It's yeah. not that I'm anti the product or the project. It just means that they haven't explained who their customer is, let alone how they're going to get in front of them. What do you think? I think we were talking about that the other day. Like, I, I, I... I, I don't, I'm not sure if I was talking with you, but I was talking about it with somebody else. But like at the, at the end of the day, like I I agree with you. 
you know what I mean? Like, I, I think the most valid point you made was, is that, okay, we need to find a solution for a problem that everyday people are facing, but then present them with the solution, but then an actual, like, there needs to be a benefit. It can't just be like, that, like people need to need to use your product, but also solve, be solving a real, real problem at the same exact time. You know what I mean? Like we can create something like, like if there's a cure for cancer, you know, and we put it on the blockchain, is that really going to do anything? No. Like, you know what I mean? Like that's what medicine's for. That's a whole different thing. But if you can solve like, like what you guys are doing, like, I don't mean to be bringing it back to you. It's just that this is what I think about is because of the conversations that we had. And as far as when, when we talked about Tusk and what they were doing or what you guys are planning to do. And as far as how you guys, your approach and as far as how, what you guys are focusing on and how you broke down your business plan to me was, was I was blown away. I, I really was. And I noticed that in, like how you were saying all these other projects, all these top, top, top projects. Great. You have the marketing, you, you have the numbers, you have the market cap, but who's using it and why are people going to use it is the question. I still, I still haven't been presented with that answer. You know, so there, there's very few, maybe aside from maybe Litecoin, that's the only one that I've seen maybe that has adoption, maybe from like the Miami Dolphins. And as far as, you know, the use cases where you can use it on that new app or whatever it is that, that they're using. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm lost. Can, can... Well, I appreciate, you know, you, you pimp and, or, you know, mention our project cause we have worked really hard to, and, and we've worked really hard over the last year and a half to get to where we are. And we do think about these things a lot, but to me, I, I have a lot of history working with startups and I'm a serial entrepreneur and and the first thing I ask a new entrepreneur, like someone who hasn't been an entrepreneur, and you can always tell a new entrepreneur that they're green and that they're going to struggle by asking a few simple questions. And I went through this twice uh, in Las Vegas the other day uh, when I was down there for another conference. And I was introduced some, to some new entrepreneurs that are trying to come up with some projects in, in, different, in different industries. And the first thing I ask is, who is your market? And they look at me like, what do you mean? And I, I'd like to see a very specific answer. And when you ever hear an entrepreneur or someone who wants to be an entrepreneur said, anybody in the world that does this, <laughs> then, that, and that tells me right off the bat that they probably have no clue who their customer is and they're probably not going to be successful. And and I don't mean that in a disrespectful way, but yeah, if I said my cryptocurrency could be used by anyone who doesn't like fiat or, you know, some nonsense generalized statement like that, that doesn't tell me that you've thought about this because let's, you know, I know from a marketing and business standpoint that, yeah, big markets are great to go after, but unless you, even if you have the, a giant marketing budget, it's very challenging to go after every single industry on the planet that could use your features and benefits with your project. You need to be focused and you need to be laser focused on where you think you can get the best traction the fastest um, and where you have the most success converting people over to using your product or service. And you need to be very, 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 very specific about that, especially in a big market because most people don't have unlimited marketing budgets or unlimited amounts of time to educate people. And so it's interesting when you go and talk to engineers uh, leading certain crystal projects, you get the same kind of responses. Well, anybody who blank, you know, or every person in the world uh, that could, you know, doesn't like banks or whatever. And, you know, that's nonsense. Those aren't, those aren't actual people that think about and understand sales and marketing and product launches. Now, it doesn't mean that they can't learn. They certainly can. But if that's their generic statement, I would tell you that they have a really difficult time. They're going to have a really difficult time being successful with that. And that's just been my experience. But what backs me up is how angel investors and VCs ask these same questions. And they'll excoriate 
uh, a startup entrepreneur who can't nail down exactly who their customer is, exactly what their customer looks like, and can articulate a strategy to put their product or service in the hands of that potential user. And unless you can do that very clearly and, and clearly articulate it, I believe they're going to struggle. And unfortunately, with the crypto space, that's more, that's more often than not the case is what I've seen. I agree. And I hate to circle back. And it's just you brought you brought up a word as far as like VC and venture capitalism and as far as exactly what they look for and whatnot. Like recently as far as with Telcoin, they are they're partnered with one of the largest VC firms, East Ventures in Asia. And they just doubled down on Telcoin. The reason why is obviously they see something they are able to, you know, meet or achieve all those targets they previously had previously. And then hopefully going forward, they've set new ones. You know, they've, they've, they've obviously given them a little, you know, bigger piece of the equity or whatnot, but I don't see other people. I don't, I don't see other people being able to answer those questions, you know, at least the way it, I, 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 don't, I don't, I don't think anybody would be able to answer it or articulate themselves as well as you just did um, for nine. Let me, let, let me explain another way. And I'm not going to pick on any one project, but I will a little bit. Ethereum. Go ahead. Who, who is Ethereum? Yeah, we were intended, talking about this. Yeah, we, I think we talked about it a little bit. I go, but who's Ethereum's customer? <laughs> Anyone who and now, on ETH. <laughs> that's, that's yeah, right. But, but to me, um, I think of a smart contracts platform in a certain way. Yeah. It does a certain thing. It's for people that want to have some, you know, utility from a blockchain, but don't want to build their own. To me, yeah. that's what a smart contracts platform more or less is. Now, to me, there's all sorts of potential customers that might be interested in such a product or service. However, if you go and talk to any of the major smart contracts platforms, teams and ask them who their customer is or their intended market is for their smart contract platform, they can't give you an answer. They can't say, oh, it's major corporations above $300 million that are focused in this sector or that sector. Or maybe it could be a large contract programming comp software development companies that want to build semi walled permissions blockchains for other customers. You know, I would love to hear that kind of response to that question, but you don't. You always get anybody who needs a smart contract, blah, 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 which again, that tells me two things. One, they really haven't thought about who their customer is. And two, they have no plan on how to put their product in the market. Because if you can't clearly define and clearly articulate who your exact intended customer is, you can't develop a go-to-market strategy to get in front of them because you don't know who they are. It makes all the sense in the world. I'm not picking on Vitalik. I'm not picking on any of these platforms. I'm just saying is, you know, the companies that are out there or the projects that have multi-billion dollar market caps could sure as hell hire a couple VPs of marketing or marketing consultants to come help sort that stuff out. Uh, and they would probably tell Vitalik or people from the certain, like maybe the Ethereum Foundation, maybe you need to go to industry conferences uh, in the space you're looking at providing services to. Uh, I don't believe a decentralized project is immune from the laws of marketing, sales, and business development. Even if it's just an ownership difference. I tell people when I'm talking to non-technical, non-blockchain people, when I'm talking about what a decentralized project is, I said, and, and cause they don't get it. They don't understand a decentralized. Most people can't grasp the concept of a no company, right? They can't figure it out. It's, it's just a new thing. It's really abstract. So you still have to figure out a way to talk to those people and communicate the ideas, even though it's an, an abstraction. So for instance, I'll tell people, well, we're a decentralized project. It's kind of like a nonprofit. Bing. <laughs> okay. And technically, a, a, you know, a DAO or decentralized project is a nonprofit. Yeah. But when you say it like that, 
where the focus of the project isn't on make, you know, because even Tusk, our focus is not making profit or, you know, empowering CEOs and all that kind of stuff. That's not what we're doing. We're like a nonprofit. And if you say it and articulate it like that, it makes sense to people. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and you got to you got to communicate with people in a way that makes sense to them. But I think that in right now, until the major projects out there kind of really focus and double down on who they are and who their customers are, and then figure out a way to get in front of them, I'd believe that the market is completely wide open from an opportunity standpoint. And I do believe the projects, and I'm not saying it's going to be tough, but it could be any projects that really have the go-to-market strategy, the go-to-market definitions, the market segmentation, and all those ducks lined up and around. And those projects, once they start getting out there, are going to be very, very, very successful in this space. Because I do absolutely see lots and lots of problems that crypto and blockchain can solve. But I don't see the folks in the industry actually trying to actually make the connection for end users that way. It seems that too many of the blockchain and crypto projects are really just focused on market cap and in, you know, improving the, the number of people investing in their projects rather than the number of users using their products. You know, for instance, uh, we're focused on the gun industry and I go to lots and lots of gun related events. I talk to lots and lots of influencers and lots of people in the industry and nobody, and I've talked to hundreds of people in this space, sure. not sure. one has ever been in contact with someone from a project in crypto besides us before us. None of them. They've heard of Bitcoin. They've and I have it. <laughs> they, everybody's heard the word Bitcoin. Yeah. Two years ago, the big pump, everybody's heard the word Bitcoin. It usually has a negative stigma attached to it. No one really understands what it is. And no one's met anybody from the Bitcoin project. That's what I see out there. And I go to industry conferences. So I have like one foot in the industry and one foot in the crypto space. And when I go to industry stuff, I'm the only guy out there they're talking to them. So I'm the only one that's interested in expressing an interest and in try to hold their hand and provide customer support through our project, which is kind of how we're trying to go to market. And to me, that makes no sense, especially with the massive amount of resources some of these, you know, top 10, top 20 crypto foundations have available that at this point, they're still not putting people in charge of business development and marketing in it's any right. routine way. If I had their money, I'd burn mine. I'll, I'll put it to you that way. If I had uh, their money, I'd burn mine. But like you, know, I, like you said, how do, how do you not put something in place? How do, how do you, if you, if you don't want to do it, you guys have the capital to hire probably some of the best and brightest minds in the world. That's what I don't understand. So think of it this way. Even if this is my take. Even if there's no company and you just have a foundation and let's just say, pick, let's just say it's Bitcoin, right? Let's just say Bitcoin doesn't have a foundation. It doesn't have a marketing team, but let's just say you're a bag holder of Bitcoin, right? You're one of these infamous Bitcoin billionaires that are running around, right? You're telling me these guys can't go pay a couple guys 150 K a year to blow up their project and get out there and really find use cases just out of their own pocket. If you're a billionaire and you're and you love this this crypto product so much, or let's just say you're even worth a couple hundred million dollars from the investment side, of, why aren't you personally just going and hiring salespeople to go and market it? I know I would be because I know if I, I don't I don't know once you get past that threshold of where you have that kind of like excuse my language fuck you money, like I'm gonna do everything I damn well possibly sure. To make sure that investment, that nest egg I have, just continually grows. And in this world, you need to spend money to make money. Like, why not? I don't, don't, like, I don't see anybody do, doing it. The only person like I maybe see doing it is maybe like John McAfee. But who else? Who else? Like, you know what I mean? Like, John McAfee was running for president. Like, yeah, it may be a little bit of an, you know, an ego trip or whatever it is and his, his ploy against, you know, getting back at the U.S. government. But at the end of the day, his promotion is all about adoption. Like, you know, that's what he wants. But because, yeah, it's going to help him, you know, help him in his pockets. But he also knows if he can get on a bigger, louder stage, he's going to be able to speak and reach to a bigger audience. 
And that's the same thing that David, that David is trying to, that, that David is doing. David's running for Congress, not because he wants to win. It's not because of anything like that at all. But it's to give the people, you know, of New York that haven't heard of crypto before, you know, it opens their ear. And if he does win, you know, what do you think his, his thing is going to be? It's going to be on regulation, how it was built 75 million years ago and how nothing has changed and we're, we're behind and how all these products and all these bright and brilliant minds that we have from MIT, these business majors from Stanford and everybody else, they're leaving to go work on these blockchain projects overseas. Like, why not keep them and let's work on something where we can create something in the country and let it stay. I don't know. That's that's just that's just my my opinion. Sorry for going on a little rant there. I get a little passionate mm -hmm. once in a while. No, I think we're both ranting at this point, but it's because we're passionate. And you know, you and I, I think you and I both agree, and we see the value in the fact that you know, getting mass adoption is going to require. Uh, a whole other level of customer support and marketing and sales and product launches and developments and basically some business acumen. Now, and it's frustrating to at least me and probably you that you got the big dogs in the space that want to tell everybody else how to do crypto and you got these maximalists telling people how they should do crypto and whether you're doing it right or wrong or how what's a fair launch or what's pre my you know, all these different like laws that they've dictated about the industry yet the same cats that got these massively full bags because they just got in early won't open those bags up to actually go and do the little bit of work to make it happen yeah and and that's frustrating to a guy like me who really does want to see decentralization i didn't have any plan to like start a project you know, it took it took some time for me to like really understand the space when I started really evaluating the crypto space and started looking at where can I use crypto? Uh, how are people, and, and to me, how are people, these projects running these projects getting in front of people? And you don't see it happening and we didn't see it happening. And once we decided to, you know, solve a problem with crypto, we got out there and it's funny because you get nothing but hate <laughs> from the maxis out there. And you say, look, if you weren't doing this, we wouldn't need to. But it's so counterproductive. It mind boggles me. Like, I, like I'm like i all for it, you know, be a maximalist, everything, like, you know, just Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. But, like, it goes back to our point, like, what it, what, how is Bitcoin being used? Like, you, you like you said, it, I still believe the door is open for, you know, a project to come in to be actually used and for transactions and all this. Like, like let's, let's be real. Bitcoin's slow, you know, it's slow. It's not going to be that end all be all. So why just have that closed mindedness and say, this is it, this is, that's it. Like if we're all praying and preaching for adoption, we should be rooting for everybody, you know, besides the people that are blatant, obvious scammers, but anybody that's trying to be an entrepreneur in the space or anybody that, that wants to do something is helping the overall, like, I, 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 I just don't get it. Like, you know what I mean? And, and I don't like the bullying that I see sometimes too, you know, like, you know, putting people down or it's like, you know, my sports team is better than yours. So you know what? Yours stinks. Like, no, like, yeah, be passionate about the one you like, but there's no reason to not give credit where credit's due or at least applaud people for trying. Like, I don't know. That, that's at least where, where, well, at least where I come from in that standpoint. Um, well, I think it makes sense, right? I mean, I, I was kind of joking about it earlier. It says people aren't wearing Visa shirts and arguing Visa is better than MasterCard on the street, right? And there's a reason for that because no one gives a shit no. because they're just utilitarian kind of payment networks and people don't get excited or polarized over it. Whereas crypto, in many respects, is very religious. People have wrapped, and I think what happens, people have wrapped their own identity around, you know, being an evangelist for a specific product or project. And they do that for so long that they kind of, from an ego standpoint, kind of sell themselves into a corner. Yeah. And then if someone says their baby's ugly or maybe another project comes along that's a little better or a little different that might be more successful, instead of saying, yeah, you're right, this part of my baby's kind of ugly, 
they they say no your baby's ugly and since i was here first ours is better than yours and i think that's inherently um i think it's very uh, narrow-minded but i think it holds back crypto and i i used an example with someone recently that says let's just say you're a retailer and you have some interest in accepting a major crypto project but it's a decentralized project with no you know no customer support no tech team to call no phone number to call if you get a problem but you still want to use it so where do you go you go onto forums and you go onto crypto twitter and let's just say you're interested in bitcoin right and i like to use bitcoin because it's got the biggest communities out there but now you're saying, well, I need something that's fast and I need something that's, you know, consistent and pretty cheap. And, and then they, they look at, a, you know, a different fork of Bitcoin. And if they mention that, they'll be excoriated. What do you think that retailer is going to do? He's going to run away. <laughs> so, I, and, and to me, I believe that maximalism and, and toxic maximalists actually are holding back the adoption of crypto for that reason. I agree. I really do. Um, I, w I wanted to close with this. I want to give your audience something. Um, I want to share with you guys something that we haven't shared, hasn't been out on Twitter yet. Uh, it's a partnership that we uh, just landed a few days ago um, that we're solidifying or having my graphic designer make it up right now currently. Um, but before I get to that, I wanted to offer, we have, we have a partnership with Mazer Gaming, one of the best um, you know, Gears of War teams um, out there, e-gaming e -gaming team. And we are currently about to build three new teams on three different games, besting in Europe. Um, I want to offer to whatever it is we offer as far as up to 25% off discount on that, 50% off any company interesting looking to offer in our magazine. But also if this YouTube, if this podcast right here gets over a hundred retweets, I will randomly pick somebody and they can pick any project they want and we will give them a free interview or a free write up about their whole entire project too as well. Now, the partnership that we just struck with is Travel by Bit. So Travel by Bit is powered by Binance. So Travel by Bit will be our traveling partner and all funds will be paid via BNB for Gokshin. The next event that we're heading to is we're heading to the uh, Washington Elite down in Miami, and then I'm going to be staying there for the week and be going to be attending the uh, North American uh, Bitcoin Conference. So I extend the invitation to you. I would love for you to come if it's possible. I'm already going. Are you going? See, look at look. Did we just become best friends? Damn, man, we're going to meet up down there. It, it's going to be a good time. I, I'm going to all those events as well. So I got to represent. Um, but hey, you know, what we'll do is we'll uh, put all those details in the blog post that uh, accompanies this podcast so people can access it. So if they want to check it out, it just go to robmcneely.com and you'll be able to find all the details about what's going on with your promo. So Mr. Riley, Vinny, where can people find out more about all the various things that you're doing? Uh, you can go ahead and follow us on Twitter at Gokstein. Um you can follow us on our website, goshin.com. You can check us out. We have a Discord. We have a Twitter. We have a Telegram. Um, my personal Twitter handle is at Riley Vinny. Um, but that's really it, man. That's it. And well, You know what? I've had a really good time today, and you are always welcome to come back on the show when you got any updates or some cool stuff happening. So make sure uh, you keep me in the loop on all the stuff you're doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Rob, thank you so much for inviting me on. It was an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Anytime, Vinny. And make sure you hit that subscribe button. This is Rob McNeely. Check us out on the web at robmcneely.com. The Rob McNeely Program is the nexus of cryptocurrency, blockchain technology, and entrepreneurship. Now, welcome to the program.